well, to to paraphrase Charles Dickens, it is the best of times. It is the worst of times, because in a sense, uh, things are absolutely great today. Let's just take it from the point of view of browsers and browser support for standards and what you can do in a browser today, just straight out of the box, is amazing compared to the past. I mean, we can't, we there are some little differences between browsers, but honestly not like it used to be. Back in the day, if you were a web developer, you spent maybe 50% of your time battling specific browser bugs, you know, trying to make one browser work like another browser, all this stuff, trying to make up for lack of standards. You know, it's funny, I was listening to um, a, a panel discussion we did at a conference, I think 11 years ago, the App Media Conference in London. And one of the questions I was asking the panelists were like, oh, what's your wish wish list for CSS or browsers in general? And they were saying things like, oh, if we had if we had multiple background images, everything would be perfect. We'd all my problems would be solved. You know, all this they were all saying things that we have. They're all saying things that we have today. And we've got more. Like we have so much today that you couldn't even imagine in the past. I mean, things like service workers where you can literally control network level stuff, uh, amazing CSS things with Grid now and Flexbox. Amazing, right? So on the one hand, yes, things are better than they've ever been. And then on another hand, not so much because, well, first of all, in the area of browsers, the fact that making a browser is now so complicated that only very, 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 very few companies and organizations could do it. And we're kind of down to just two or three browser rendering engines, that's not very healthy for something like the web, which has always thrived on diversity. So that's something we'll see how that plays out. So I'm, I'm uncomfortable about that, but remains to be seen. But then on, in terms of things being, in my opinion, worse than they were before, it's less to do with what we get from browsers and more to do with how we choose to make things on the web. Like we seem to have collectively decided to make things really complicated in terms of, I want to put something on the web, you know, that used to be relatively straightforward. And I know there was all sorts of problems with um, the way we used to do it and maybe it didn't scale so well, but we seem to have collectively decided that the, the barrier to entry to putting something on the web requires loads of technologies, not browser technologies, but technologies that sit on our computers or sit on our servers, uh, you know, um, it's great that we've got version control and build tools and automatic, you know, bundlers and all this stuff. But the level of complexity is is extremely high, it seems to me. And I know I'm 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 slow, and maybe that's the reason. Like I'm just not very good at picking this stuff up. But it seems to be objectively quite complex, and that strikes me as strange because, as I was saying, you can do more with less these days in a browser. Like it's easier than ever to build something interactive in a browser with you know quite minimal HTML, bit of JavaScript, CSS, right? You, you can do loads with what you get out of the browser. And yet we've decided to almost reinvent everything for ourselves. Like even though the browser will let us do all this really smart stuff, let's reinvent it in JavaScript for ourselves. Let's reinvent um, going from URL to URL and we'll call it routing and we'll do all that ourselves and we'll do it all in JavaScript. And that means now we have to manage state and so we're keeping track of all this stuff. It's weird because it's a choice to do that stuff. And yet we're acting as though it's uh, the default. You know, people people are constantly saying, oh, well, you know, expectations are different now. Um, and I would say that's true. People's expectations of the web are different, but not in the way that people mostly talk about it. When people use that phrase, oh, people's expectations of the web are different now, what they usually mean is, oh, people expect more from the web. People expect the web to be, you know, fast and, and interactive and like native apps and stuff. Um, and I think that would be great if that were true. But my observation, talking to people, is that people's expectations of the web have changed. People expect the web to be terrible. Like I talk to people, and they're simply, they've given up on the web. Uh, certainly on mobile, they just try to avoid going on the web. So yes, people's expectations of the web have changed, uh, but not for the better. They're, they're associating the web with um, bad experiences, with things being slow, with constantly being bombarded with you know, sign up to my newsletter, accept cookies, uh, dark patterns, all this stuff. And the solution to that is not, well, let's throw more complicated tool chains and JavaScript libraries and frameworks at it. The solution is to, you know, 
pull things back. And how about if we didn't have terrible user experiences that bombard people with stuff? How about if we just made websites using the bare minimum technology so that they're fast and respond quickly? Um, and yet, weirdly, we've gotten into this, this cycle where people say, oh, people's expectations of the web are so high now that we must use all this complex technology, which just ends up making the web feel, frankly, even worse. So from that perspective, things are in a pretty terrible state for the web. And yet, like I said, in terms of what you can do out of the box in a browser, just get a text editor and write some HTML, bit of CSS, bit of JavaScript, you can make amazing things straight out of the box that you know, 10, 15 years ago, we, we literally couldn't have imagined. I think the first thing to, to establish is that people learn in different ways. So the answer to this question kind of depends on the person. So, and, I, and I've experienced this myself talking to students and say code bar and stuff, is that some people, they really want to know why something is working first. Like, give me the fundamentals. Give me the, almost a bit of theory, but like show, build things up from the fundamentals upwards until we've got a thing that works. Other people, they don't, work that way, they say, I want to build something as quickly as possible, right? So, okay, let's start with a framework. Let's, you know, create React, React app or something, something that gets you like something straight away and then work backwards from there and say, okay, but what's actually going on here? Why does this work? What's what's happening under, under the hood? And so there's two different ways of learning there and neither is right and neither is wrong. There's just different ways. I think the important thing is that at some point you end up with this kind of layered, um, level of knowledge that you've got the fundamentals, you know, in the grounding, and then you can add things on top, like a framework at the tippy top of that stack. And whether you start with the framework and work down to the fundamentals or start with the fundamentals and work up to the framework, I don't think that matters as long as what you end up with is a nice rounded kind of um, a stack of technologies. And then I, I think what you learn over time, and this is, I feel is something you can be told, but you kind of have to just learn it yourself and experience it, is that the stuff further down, the fundamentals will change at a much slower pace. And the stuff higher up, the abstractions, the frameworks, the tools, they will change at a faster pace. And that, and once you know that, that's then it's okay. Then that feeling of kind of being overwhelmed is like, oh, you know, there's so much to learn you can start to filter it and, and sort of figure out, well, where do I want to concentrate? Do I want to learn stuff that I know I will have to swap out in another year, two years, three years, or will I concentrate my time on this lower level fundamental stuff that will last for maybe decades? Uh, or do I split it? Do I dedicate some of my time to fundamentals and some of my time to the abstractions? But I think the key thing is that you go in with your eyes open about the nature of the thing you're learning. So if I'm going to learn about HTML, and to a certain extent CSS and stuff, then I will know, okay, this is knowledge that will last for quite a while. It's not going to change too quickly. But if I'm learning about a framework or a build tool or something like that, then I was like, okay, it's fine that I'm learning this, but I shouldn't be under any illusions that this is going to be forever and not be surprised when, you know, further down the line, people say, oh, you're still using that framework? We don't use that anymore. We use this other framework now, right? I think that's the key thing is going in with your eyes open. It's totally fine to, to you know, study all the stuff, learn all the stuff, as long as you're not disappointed, you know, like, oh, I invested all my time in that framework and now nobody's using that framework anymore. anymore. We've all moved on to this other framework. Um, you, well, there's a phrase from uh, DevOps where you talk about your servers and they say, you know, treat your servers like uh, cattle, not pets, right? Don't don't get too attached to them. And I feel like that's the case with a lot of the tools we use. And I would, I would consider frameworks and libraries to be tools. It's like they're tools, you use them to help you work faster, but don't, don't get too attached to them because they will change. Whereas they're more fundamental stuff you can, can rely on. Now, when I say fundamental stuff, to a certain extent, I'm talking about the technology stuff. Like, yeah, HTML, That's that moves at a slow pace. Um, you know, just HTTP and H, how, how the internet works, you know, that's not going to change very fast. But when I say fundamentals, I think you can go deeper than that even. And you can talk about philosophies and attitudes and ways of approaching uh, how to build something on the web that's completely agnostic to technologies. In other words, it's like what, what your mindset is when you approach building something, what your priorities are, 
what you value. Uh, those kind of things can last for a very, very long time, longer than any technologies. Uh, so, for example, over time uh, on the web, I've come to realize that progressive enhancement, which is completely technology agnostic, it's just a way of thinking, is a good long-term investment. That even as technologies come and go, this approach of thinking of in, a, in a sort of layered way and building up from the you know, most supported thing to least supported thing, um, works really well, no matter what the technology is that comes along. So when Ajax came along in 2005, I could uh, I could take the progressive enhancement approach and apply it to Ajax. When responsive design came along in 2010, I could take progressive enhancement, apply it to responsive design. When uh, progressive web apps come along, whatever it happens to be, I can take this approach, this fundamental approach, and apply it to whatever the new technology is. Um, and those things tend to be, you know, really long lasting. And those kind of approaches, almost strategies, I guess, are things that can, can, can last a long time. I mean, you should always be questioning them. You should always be saying, is this still relevant? Does this still work in this situation? Does it still apply? And over a long time period, you start to, you know, get an answer to that. It's like, yeah, actually, it's funny. Uh, even over 20 years, this particular strategy works really well, whereas some other strategy that worked well, you know, 15 years ago, it turns out just doesn't even apply today because some technology has made it obsolete. So, yeah, fundamental things aren't necessarily technologies. And I think a, a web developer is well is well versed in getting to grips with those fundamental things but at the same time, I'm not sure if you could learn those first, you know, I'm not sure if you could like, okay, we're going to learn about these fundamental things without touching a line of code. It's like, you kind of have to learn them for yourself by doing it and, and learning over time, I think. But yes, absolutely. The things that people are pushing the envelope with in terms of frameworks today will become the standards of tomorrow. I, I think I would put good money on that because I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen in the past that generally, and it's usually in JavaScript that we, we figure something out, we figure out what we want, and we make it work in JavaScript first. And if it's a really powerful idea that solves a common problem, it will find its way further down. Like the classic example, you know, early on, uh, I'm talking in the 90s now, the first uses of JavaScript were things like doing image rollovers, right? And now we don't need JavaScript for that because we use hover in CSS. So it's such a common use case. It moved down into the kind of uh, declarative layer. Same with uh, form validation, right? You'd have to write your own form validation. Now you can just do required in HTML and stuff like that. And so this pattern plays out over and over again. With responsive images, we figured out what we wanted in JavaScript, and then we got it in HTML, right, with picture. So uh, yes, I think the goal of any good framework or library should be to make itself redundant. And a classic example of this would be jQuery. You don't need jQuery today because all the stuff that jQuery did for you, like um, using CSS selectors to find DOM nodes, you can do that now in the browser using query selector, query selector all. But of course, the only reason why query selector exists is because jQuery proved it was powerful and people wanted it. So... I think absolutely a lot of the things that people are currently using uh, frameworks and libraries for will become part of the standards, whether that's to do with the idea of, you know, a, a virtual DOM, um, state management, um, managing, you know, uh, page transitions, you know, giving us control over that. Yes, absolutely. That will find its way in now. Whether the specific implementations will be these things like web components and 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 uh, Houdini and stuff like that, that's interesting. We'll see how that plays out. I mean, that's all part of this bigger idea of the extensible web, right? Where in the past we would get specific things like, oh, here's the picture element, or here's this new JavaScript uh, API, whatever. Um, here's query selector. Whereas now we're sort of being given, okay, here are the nuts and bolts of how a browser works. You build the solutions, and then. We'll see what happens. And that's that's an interesting idea. And I guess the theory is then that, okay, so let's say we, we get web components, we get Houdini, and now we all start building uh, our own you know widgets, and we all start building our own CSS functions. And the theory is that the ones that are really popular and really good will then get standardized and end up in the standards. I'm not sure if that's actually going to happen, because I wonder if 
what a standards body or browser make would actually say is, oh, well, we don't need to make a part of the standard because everyone can just use the web component. Everyone can just use this Houdini thing, right? Um, we'll see whether that works out. I wonder if it'll end up maybe like the situation with jQuery plugins. So I mentioned that jQuery was great in a show. This is what people want, and it ended up as a standard. But as well as jQuery, the library, you also had jQuery plugins, the ecosystem, where everybody built a thousand different carousels, a thousand different widgets. And there was no quality control, and you couldn't figure out which was the right one to use. I worry that that might be where we end up with things like web components and Houdini and stuff like that. But it's it's an interesting idea, that's this extensible web thing. Well, that's up to us. You know, these things are created by people. Um, so it's... That's that's something to be aware of when when people come into the web think like oh what should I learn what's the what's the tool what's the methodology how will we be, be building websites it's almost like uh, what horse should I be backing here you know what's a safe bet and you got to step back and realize these things aren't handed down from heaven you know some kind of decision has been made and then passed on to us we make those decisions we decide how the web gets built you know there's no central authority on this stuff we collectively decide it so. You can choose how you, how the future of web development is going to look. You can choose what a workflow is going to look like that that you know works for you and works for other people. Um, the web's super flexible. You can choose to build in this layered way that I've talked about. You know, progressive enhancement, very resilient way of working. But you don't have to. You know, the, the web doesn't mandate that you work that way. You could choose to build in a way that you just do everything in JavaScript, right? Make JavaScript do the routing and the and the DOM and everything in JavaScript. And it's a choice. So it's not like, oh, in the future, we will all do this. In the future, we will all do that. It's like in the future, you will make a choice about how you, dis how you want to build. Um, and I think... Too often, though, when, when we're sort of making those decisions, or how should I build or what's the best way to build something on the web? I, I worry that sometimes we think about it a bit too much from our perspective. What's the best way for me to build on the web? What's, what's going to make things easiest for me as a developer? And I don't want to make things hard for us. I don't want life to be difficult. But I do think our priority should actually be what, what's going to make things better for the user, even if that means more work from us, right? Um, especially if you're getting paid, if you're getting a paycheck to make things on the web, then again, kind of going back to responsibility. Now, it's not about you now, right? You're, you have a duty of care to the people who will be using the thing you're building. So decisions about how to build on the web shouldn't just be made according to what you like, what you uh, think is nice for you, what makes your life easy, what saves you typing. But should be more informed by what's going to be better for users, what's going to um, be more resilient, what's going to leave uh, nobody behind, you know, something that's available to everyone. I know I'm talking a lot in abstractions and, and vagaries, but it, it, the, the talk at uh, ViewSource will go into a little more detail. I think the first thing to establish is that I don't want to paint too rosy a picture of how things were in the past. You know, there's always been problems. It's just we might have different problems today. So, you know, I remember the days of, you know, literal pop-up windows, you know, that would or pop under windows, you know, things like that, really annoying things uh, that eventually browsers had to come in and kind of stamp down on that stuff. And that's sort of happening today as well with some of the, the egregious tracking and surveillance. You see Safari and Firefox taking steps to, to limit that. Um, you know, in the past, I would have said, oh, we need to figure this out. We need to almost self-regulate, you know, before it's too late. And at this point, I think, no, that's it's, it is too late. And regulation is coming. GDPR is a first step in that, and there will be more. Uh, and we deserve it. We, we had our chance to figure this stuff out for ourselves and do the right thing, and we blew it. And, and things are, are really bad when it comes to surveillance and tracking. Um, a lot of the business models you know, seem to be predicated on tracking. Uh, and I'm saying tracking here, not advertising. Advertising isn't the issue here. It's specifically tracking. So, and it's a bit of a shame that we talk about, you know, ad blockers as a software. Like most people are not blocking ads. What they're blocking is tracking. So 
again, in the same way that browsers had to kind of step in and stop pop-ups and pop under windows, um, now we see, you know, ad blockers, tracking blockers stepping in to solve it. So, so we get this kind of um, battle, right? It's almost like an arms race that's been going on. I think regulation is going to come in on top of that. Guaranteed, it's going to happen. Uh, and you're right, the, the fundamental business models in use today are kind of at, at odds with, with privacy and surveillance. Um, so they might need to change. Although I don't think, I don't think advertising requires tracking. And a lot of people talk as though it does. People talk like, oh, you can't have advertising without a track thing. You absolutely can. You know, sponsorship, um, other kinds of advertising absolutely work. And and the other thing is the tracking just, it doesn't, it's not very good. Like if, if I'm advertised to with something that absolutely suits my needs, then it kind of ceases to be advertising and just becomes useful, right? That's not what I experience. What I experience is just really badly targeted things. So it's not even like the tracking works and yet people claim tracking is essential. Anyway, so uh, when I say business models need to change, I don't mean advertising. I think advertising is actually a reasonable business model for some kinds of, of services. Uh, but that connection between advertising and tracking, um, that that needs to be severed. And some people think that's impossible. They say, like, you, no, it's, it's just a, a law of nature that those two things go together. And that's not true. We chose that. And it's the other thing to remember is that we sometimes look around to see how things are today, and we can't imagine it could be any different, right? We see one dominant search engine and so we think there could only ever be one dominant search engine but that's not true that's just the way things have turned out we see you know big social network like facebook and we think oh there could only ever be one big social network but again that's just the way things have turned out in our situation so i think the worst thing we can do is assume things are inevitable and it's inevitable things end up that way and that's particularly true when it comes to surveillance and tracking and things that are anti-privacy to say, well, that's just the way it is. It's in, it's inevitable, and it couldn't be any other way. I think the first step is that we have to have the uh, imagination to think about the, how things could be different, how things could have turned out differently, and then work towards uh, making that a reality. Also, this is a huge opportunity. You know, people are clearly you know fed up with the the tracking. They're fed up with the surveillance. They don't mind the advertising. There is a separation there. There is an opportunity here. Um, to take on these, you know, big organizations who literally can't change their business model. You know, someone like Google, the idea of tracking surveillance is kind of intrinsically linked to their their core business model. Um, and that gives a huge opportunity. And you can see Apple already starting to exploit this opportunity, but uh, other people too, where you can make uh, privacy and lack of tracking your selling point, right? Uh, it's a way for a small player to suddenly maybe disrupt um, the incumbents because the incumbents are so reliant on on tracking, right? You can take on Facebook by trying to be another Facebook, but you can take on Facebook by being what Facebook can't do, right? Not what Facebook won't do, what Facebook literally can't do. So there's there's actually a big opportunity there. Um, but yeah, I, I when, when we talk about the good old days of, you know, keeping track of things, blogs, I, I kind of share that because I remember the good old days as well. But I, I would say I see a bit of a resurgence as well. I see, you know, enough people are getting fed up with, you know, just posting on silos like Twitter and, and Facebook and, and stuff that I see more and more people launching their own websites again and publishing there. And uh, I hope we'll see more of that. For people. Yeah, this is an interesting question because it's happened over and over again over the course of my career about 20 years now where I would think like, Oh, there's nothing really exciting. And then something comes along and I get oh, really excited, you know? So I was kind of puttering along when CSS came along. Like, oh, this is really interesting. And then years later, Ajax and like, Oh, this is really interesting. Um, I think currently service workers are the things that get me excited, get me thinking about, Oh, the potential for what the web could be. The potential for the user experience on the web is huge. Um, and I don't even think the, the the challenges are technological because it's pretty straightforward using service workers. It's more changing people's expectations of the web. The idea that, oh, you should be able to uh, open a browser or hit a, a bookmark and have something happen, even if you don't have an internet connection or even if you are on a crappy network, that things could still be quite reliable. Um, that's such a fundamental change. That gets me very, very excited. It's also obviously a huge challenge to change that. But... I have to say, over a long enough time period, the things that I start to think about start to be less and less about specific technologies. 
and more and more about just the web in general and the people making the web. And I certainly have fears for the web. And they aren't so much around technologies like, oh, will one particular browser maker dominate or will one particular framework be the only technology around? Th those things are concerning. It's more about, will the idea of being able to make for the web start to get reduced down to an elite kind of priesthood of a certain kind of person? Um, frankly, kind of person who looks like me, right? White, male, uh, privileged European, uh, that we're the only people who get to make for the web, and that would be terrible. I think the real potential of the web and the promise of the web from the early days was that it's for everyone, that anybody should be able to not just use the web and consume it, but anyone should be able to add to it and build for it. And so the thing that actually you know, motivates me now is less about a specific technology and more about how can I try and get uh, a more diverse range of people uh, making the web, making their own careers out of making for the web, um, rather than it being reduced, reduced, reduced to a, a certain kind of person. Um, you know, if when, when I'm done with all this, if I look around and all the other people making websites look just like me, then uh, I think we'll have failed.